Tonight on Bridge City News. The SNC-Lavalin scandal is not going away, and now the Prime Minister's principal secretary has quit. We hear from Brian Lilly about what that means for the governing Liberals. The United We Roll Pro Pipeline rally has arrived in Ottawa, many from the West protesting Ottawa's lack of help for the energy sector. And the Canada Winter Games continue in Red Deer. We will tell you just how well Alberta is doing. Thanks so much for joining us. The federal Conservatives are supporting an NDP motion demanding Prime Minister Justin Trudeau call for a public inquiry into the SNC-Lavalin affair. The two parties want to get to the bottom of the allegations that PM's office pressured former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould to resolve charges against the Quebec engineering giant without a criminal prosecution. Wilson-Raybould resigned last week and Trudeau's principal secretary, Jerry Butts, quit yesterday. Butts says he's become a distraction to the government's work. MPs today reacted to the Butts resignation. My sense is that he's decided, I think appropriately, to defend himself against uh, you know, people saying things that just aren't true. I think he, he stated his position, he's shared a letter, um, I think he's been available, and I think that's a decision for him to make. Obviously, everyone, every Canadian, all of us, uh, we want to shed some lights on the recent events. Uh, I'm very happy. Uh, personally, that the uh, ethics commissioner, which is impartial and independent, has uh, taken the task to bring the light to that. We, as the government, will continue to focus on what matters to Canadian, uh, which is our plan, which is delivering for middle class. So this is what we're going to be talking about. Like Political journalist Brian Lilly joins me now from Toronto. Brian, you've been following this story very closely. What does the Butts resignation mean for Trudeau? I think it means that this uh, problem, this scandal that the prime minister has been dealing with continues to go on. It probably grows because while a lot of Canadians knew about it, according to a recent Ipsos poll, and I'll tell you a bit about that and how it's hurting Trudeau's numbers, about only slightly less than half of Canadians, 49%, knew all about this scandal. Now, that's high. Most Canadians don't follow politics. So when 49% start hearing about it and they hear about scandal and they hear about resignations, well, and then you have a big resignation, even more Canadians are going to hear about it. And then it starts to people say, well, wait a minute, this looks shady. What's going on? And they start asking questions. So this means that the, the scandal continues and it's all bad news for the PM. Now, is this the beginning of the end for the Trudeau Liberals? Too soon to tell as far as the, uh, the election in October goes. But let me just give you some quick numbers here from that Ipsos poll I mentioned. The uh, Liberals are down four points from December to 34% support among voters. The sheer Conservatives are up, 30, uh, up two points to 36%. And in Ontario, it's a six-point gap. And Ontario is the big battleground, because we know in Western Canada, the Conservatives are going to sweep. In Atlantic Canada and Quebec, the Liberals do well. And in Ontario, it's always back and forth. Well, you know, sheer pulling well out ahead. People are bothered by this scandal. Will we ever hear from former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould to get her side of the story? I think that we have to, uh, whether it's at a committee or if she holds a news conference. You know, I've been talking to uh, former attorneys general like Peter McKay, the Ontario level like Michael Bryant, just spoke to him the other day and he said, look, this shield of solicitor client privilege is pretty much gone. You've got everyone else involved running around giving all the details. Uh, they can't then turn around and say, well, you can't talk about it. Just we can talk about it and badmouth you. So at some point, and remember, she uh, got the advice of former Supreme Court Justice Thomas Cromwell. At some point, I think she will break her silence. I think she will speak. And But that shouldn't be the end of it. The, the House of Commons, the opposition at least, has called for a public inquiry. I think there has to be a police investigation uh, to get to the bottom of this. Award-winning journalist Brian Lilly. Thanks so much, Brian. Thank you, Hal. The United We Roll Pro Pipeline rally has arrived in Ottawa. After driving for nearly five days, a convoy of hundreds of supporters reached our nation's capital for a massive protest against the Liberal government's energy and environmental policies. The convoy is expected to bring parts of downtown Ottawa to a halt over the next couple of days. You heard the Westerners are hurting, and in Alberta right now, 17,000 jobs in one month, 84,000 oil patch jobs since 2014. Alberta is being decimated. It's not just Justin, it's the world price of oil. We understand that. 
but you can't buy a pipeline in one side of your mouth for $4.6 billion and then sign a bill in the other side of your mouth, C69, that you'll never build another pipeline again. So to us, Justin just says one thing and does another, and we can't get our oil to, oil to tidewater. We can't build a pipeline, we can't get one east, and the carbon taxes, like how much can Canadians afford? The carbon tax for rural people, and most of the people here are rural, is a killer. We have trucks. We don't take buses. We drive big trucks at three miles a gallon. This carbon tax is another nail in our competitive coffin. That's why we're here. And the UN Compact. We're being called racist for wanting secure borders. We are not racists. We are not white nationalists. We are working, hardworking Canadians who want secure borders and one immigration queue for all. The group also wants Ottawa to reconsider Bill C-48, which bans oil tankers from the northern coast of British Columbia. A 25-year-old Brooks man has been charged with child porn offences and sexually assaulting two young boys. Thanks to the help of the Brooks RCMP and Medicine Hat Police Service, Eric Manesiak was arrested last Thursday. His home in Brooks was searched, computers and electronic devices were seized. Manesiak was a provider for spike care services in southern Alberta and was involved in community youth programs. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency says certain Eat Smart brand sweet kale vegetable salad bags are being recalled due to possible listeria contamination. The affected product was sold in Ontario, New Brunswick, Newfoundland and Labrador, but could have made its way to Alberta. They come in 340 gram packages with a best before date of February 16, 2019. You're advised to either throw the product out or return it to the store where it was purchased. The CFIA says so far there have been no reports of illnesses linked to the salad bags. If you live in the subdivisions of Edgemoor and Sunset Acres, you'll need to boil your water. Late last week, a leak was discovered on a water line which supplies water to the area. A boil water order was put in place by Alberta Health Services. The City of Lethbridge has supplied a water trailer for residences until the order is lifted. Because the water wasn't completely shut off, there was still pressure in the line. We don't anticipate that any contaminants entered, entered the line, so it was just uh, precautionary to put the advisory in place. And then we have to uh, uh, work with Alberta Health Services to get the, the boil water advisory lifted or the boil water order lift, lifted. The water line has since been repaired and the order is expected to be lifted sometime on Thursday after a second water test is taken. Many Canadians suffer from anxiety and depression. It is more common than we realize. Sarah Ball is someone who overcame severe anxiety issues. Today, she's a public speaker and author of the book, A Survivor's Guide to Overcoming Anxiety. Sarah stopped by our studio recently and I asked her what is the most important thing we can do to help someone who is battling anxiety and depression. So I think the most important thing is to, I always say, is to ask them, what, how can, how, you know, what, what can I do? And if you're the one struggling, to articulate what it is you need. This doesn't help me, this helps me when you say this. And to help them get out of their head, to have a safe place to share really uncomfortable and scary thoughts that might seem ridiculous to you, and you might go, oh my gosh, that's ridiculous. But to them, it's so absolutely real. Catch my full interview with Sarah Ball as she shares how she's winning the fight against anxiety and depression coming up in the second half of our show. You'll be seeing barricades in the Civic Commons Square around Lethbridge City Hall. Workers will be performing various geotechnical tests. It will involve drilling small holes in the ground and taking soil samples. The work, which will be completed by February 26th, is part of the Civic Common Master Plan to help for future planning. The project, which began last October, will provide a framework to guide and manage future growth and change within the Civic Common Plan area. It's designed to support many events, including recreational and cultural activities. Team Alberta won two more medals during the third day of competition in Red Deer at the Canada Winter Games. It was gold for women's moguls and a bronze in men's 1500 meter short track speed skating. That brings Alberta's tally so far to 13 medals, five gold, five silver and three bronze. That's good enough for second place just behind Quebec. Calgary surgeon Richie Gill saw his life change in a moment a year ago when he was paralyzed from the neck down in an accident in Hawaii. Gill went to Thailand to have a device installed in his spine to create electrical stimulation. The epidural stem is programmed to stimulate the nerves to allow for some movement. Gill says this technology is allowing him to have a better quality of life. Richie came to us late in the fall uh, after he came out of the hospital and Richie was looking to do some very extensive and intensive rehab um, as he was preparing to do the epidural stem. Given the nature of Richie's injury, there was 
no sensory and no volitional movement below his level of injury. So having this procedure done has allowed Richie to regain some of that function and be able to command voluntary movement below his level of injury. With my complete injury, I would not be able to move my legs at all and I wasn't able to take any steps uh, previous to this. Uh, realistically, assisted stepping uh, is where I'm at. I think um, being able to stand with assistance. Will I be able to walk on my own? It's a possibility, but I think my main focus is just trying to improve day by day and we'll see where that gets me. And hopefully as technology continues to improve, maybe that will be a possibility down the road. It is definitely fatiguing because each time you try to take a step, you have to kind of really focus and concentrate and you're hoping to get that signal will get to the right spot. So it's definitely tiring because you're constantly thinking about it over and over again. It's uh, not completely understood exactly how it works yet, but the best of it is that it seems to excite the spinal cord and allowing the signal to, in a sense, almost be amplified to be able to get to the right spot. It's definitely not a perfect system, but it, the thought is that in any type of spinal cord injury that some connection does exist, and this seems to help amplify that signal to get there. An early morning house fire in Halifax, Nova Scotia claimed the lives of seven children. Officials say the children from a Syrian family ranged in age three months to 17 years. Neighbors say the father was badly burned as well and is in hospital with life-threatening injuries. The mother is expected to survive her injuries. One neighbor said she woke to a loud bang and a woman screaming. Well, it was probably around like 12, just after 12.30 and I was laying in bed with my daughter and I heard a huge bang, like explosion. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's weird. And all I could see was like bright, bright colors and a woman screaming. So I jumped up out of bed and looked and there was flames just roaring out through their back door, back windows, everything. The mother was on the grass, like praying, I guess, like just bowing her hands down, like pulling on my husband's arm to call 911 and so that the kids were inside and the dad was sitting on the steps. I think he had gone back in because he was really burnt. And it was just, this is awful. The cause of the fire is still under investigation. Compassion Canada is a Christian organization which helps kids in 25 countries around the world. Barry Sloan White is the group's president and he talks about what sponsorship means to more than 2 million kids. It means that there are 2 million children in 25 countries who each one of them individually are connected with a caring, loving Christian sponsor who is not just uh, giving them the financial resources that they need to survive, but also more, even more importantly, they're investing in them spiritually through praying for them, through mentoring them, through letters. And we have thousands of sponsors every year who actually go and physically visit their children. That's a real bonus. Watch the entire interview with Mr. Sloan White and hear the work they're doing for Christ in so many volatile regions around the world. That's coming up in the second half of our show. Canadians trapped by violent street protests in Haiti arrived at Montreal's International Airport over the weekend. Many were quite thankful to be headed home. Today it went really well. It was really organized. The transit really did everything to get us out. The hotel also helped. It was a good team effort. So it was really nice uh, for us to get home. Um, it went really well. We also had, uh, I believe, the president and vice president of Transa there helping us, answering any questions. It was a good, uh, good day. Honestly, the resort is a little further away from the danger. It was more, what was worrisome was not knowing what to do next. And then once Transa cleared that up, it was a lot easier. We can breathe uh, easier. It was very chaotic. But like I said, it was very, very difficult. It was really, really, really bad. I got my sister was with me and I took the motorcycle, but it wasn't that easy. But finally today it was not too difficult to, to take the street. But yesterday, before yesterday, it was extremely, extremely difficult. The Canadian Embassy is now open in Haiti for consular services. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, who since surge in 2016 presidential campaign reshaped democratic politics, announced today that he's running for president in 2020. I am going to run for president, that's correct. What's going to be different this time? We're going to win. We are going to also launch what I think is unprecedented uh, in modern American history, and that is a grassroots movement, John, to lay the groundwork for transforming the economic and political life of this country. That's what's different. Bottom line for me is I think uh, it is absolutely imperative that Donald Trump uh, be defeated, 
because I think it is unacceptable and un-American, to be frank with you, that we have a president who is a pathological liar, and it gives me no pleasure to say that, but it's true. We have a president who is a racist, who is a sexist, who is a xenophobe, who is doing what no president in our lifetimes has come close to doing, and that is trying to divide us up. Seven British lawmakers say they're quitting the main opposition Labour Party over its approach to Brexit and anti-Semitism. This has been a very difficult, painful, but necessary decision. We represent different parts of the country. We are of different backgrounds. We were born of different generations, but we all share the same values. From today, we will all sit in Parliament as a new independent group of MPs. But the Labour Party we joined, that we campaigned for and believed in, is no longer today's Labour Party. We did everything we could to save it, but it has now been hijacked by the machine politics of the hard left. As Luciana said, our values haven't changed. We absolutely oppose this Conservative government and desperately want an alternative which tackles the barriers of poverty and discrimination by extending opportunity for all. A nice mild but slushy day in the city as we are seeing more seasonal temperatures, but will it continue? I'll have complete weather details coming up in just a moment. We had a mixture of sun and cloud, but mild today. Tonight, mainly cloudy with a low near minus 13. Tomorrow, chance of flurries developing and a high near minus 4. Thursday, a high pressure system returns, bringing lots of sunshine again and a high near minus 13. Friday, mainly sunny with a high near minus 5. Saturday, a few clouds roll in and we should see high of minus 6 degrees. Cooling off Sunday with a chance of flurries and a high of only minus 13. Monday, the flurry should taper off and it should warm up to minus 11. Looking at the Almanac, the average high for this time of year is plus 2 and an average low of minus 10. The highest temperature on this date was recorded in 1977 at 15 degrees, and the record low was a cold minus 37 in 1986. Sunrise was at 735, sunset at 556. Let's see how tomorrow is shaping up across the country now. Snow mixed with rain for Vancouver and a high of 5. Victoria will also see rain and 5 degrees. A good chance of snow developing and a high of minus 5 for Calgary. Flurries at minus 7 for Edmonton. It'll be mainly sunny at minus 12 degrees in Regina on Wednesday. Periods of snow at minus 12 as well for Saskatoon. Light snow at minus 9 is on tap for Winnipeg. In the central part of the country, Toronto will have light snow at minus 1. Ottawa will be overcast at minus 5. A mixture of sun and cloud at minus 5 degrees for Montreal on Wednesday. In the Maritimes, Fredericton, New Brunswick will be mainly sunny at minus 9. Halifax, Nova Scotia will also have lots of blue sky at minus 8. A slight chance of flurries developing in Charlottetown, PEI at a high of minus 11. And in St. John's, Newfoundland, expect snow and minus 15 for tomorrow. Payless Shoe Source Canada says it will soon file for creditor protection and close all 2,500 North American stores as early as the spring. Chief Restructuring Officer Stephen Morota says that the closures are taking place due to a previous restructuring that left the company ill-equipped for today's retail environment with too much debt. Of the 2,500 affected locations, close to 250 are in Canada. Popular TV streaming service Netflix is setting up a production hub in Canada. The space will be located in Toronto and will employ nearly 2,000 Canadians each year. Although the project will not be in Western Canada, Ainsley O'Reilly explains why the expansion of Netflix is exciting for local filmmakers. Back in October of 2017, Netflix announced a plan to spend $500 million on making Canadian content. The streaming service says that number will go up. And now they'll use a 164,000 square foot space in Toronto that will help make feature films and TV shows. Local cinematographers say to have their work featured by the company would be a dream. Getting funded by Netflix would be probably every filmmaker's dream. And not necessarily only because it's a big budget, but because they let people tell stories in a really unique way. Whenever you see a Netflix original, it's not a cookie cutter story. It's something that's really unique. And you know that the filmmakers put their everything in there to try to tell that story. Arjan Gill in Lethbridge owns his own production company. He says that although big cities get all the credit, living in Lethbridge has its advantages. 
Lethbridge is really a smaller market and um, that kind of is an advantage in a way, especially with social media nowadays. You don't necessarily need to be in a big city to do bigger jobs there. The thing with Lethbridge being a smaller city is you get access to more things at a cheaper price and more people at really a cheaper price. So being in Lethbridge gives you a lot more freedom to express your creativity rather than a big city where you have to get more permits and so on. At the end of the day, it may just be about keeping the Netflix dream alive, but it's all about starting small. We're well on our way now with trying to spread the word more and trying to bring people and get them on the same page to build teams that can create short films that are stunning and um, so that we can access film grants through Alberta Film, which is a government funded organization, which is all about giving grants to filmmakers around Alberta. And they especially love small towns uh, because you know they want to hear these stories coming from small towns because all the funding is going to Calgary and Edmonton, these big cities. But there needs to be more voices from these small cities coming. For Bridge City News, I'm Ainsley O'Reilly. The Canadian Cattlemen's Association says Canada's ambassador to Japan stressed the need for steady supply to better position Canada in the Japanese marketplace. The Beef Lobby Group met in Calgary recently to discuss opportunities under the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. The association says it shared industry efforts to address restraints such as workforce challenges in the processing sector. The group says 75% of Canada's beef goes to the United States, but in the next five years, it's expected that 50% of our beef will be headed to Asia. He was called a creative genius and a man ahead of his time. Karl Lagerfeld, the man behind Chanel, died today in Paris. He had two birth certificates, one dated 1933 and the other 1938. Lagerfeld looked frail in recent years and did not come out to take a bow at a recent show in Paris last month. Chanel says Lagerfeld's longtime studio head will create the house's upcoming collections. Now, here's a look at today's markets. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, hundreds of truckers arrived in Ottawa today protesting the Liberal government's carbon tax and energy policies. The United We Roll pro-pipeline rally is expected to bring much of downtown Ottawa to a halt over the next couple of days. Street closures are planned around Parliament Hill to make room for some of the semi-trailers, pickup trucks, cars and buses. Depression and anxiety can be beaten, so says Sarah Ball, author of the book, A Survival's Guide to Overcoming Anxiety. Here's Sarah's story next. But first, here's a look at what's happening in and around your community. Here's your Bridge City News community calendar. Streets Alive Mission is hosting the Coldest Night of the Year fundraiser on Saturday, February 23rd from 4 to 8 p.m. at the Evangelical Free Church of Lethbridge. This is an opportunity to explore and bring awareness to the challenges of living on the streets in winter while raising money for charitable partners who serve and engage our homeless community. For more information and to register, visit streetsalive.ca slash events. Dave McCann and the Firehearts are releasing their new album, Westbound Till Light, on Friday, March 1st at the Empress Theater in Fort McLeod at 7.30 p.m. Come and hear their collection of songs about interesting North American folklore and one that features Frank Slide. Tickets are $25 and are available at mcleodempress.com or by calling one 800 540-9229. It's the 15th annual Woods Homes Children's Benefit Gala taking place Saturday, March 30th at 6 p.m. at the Coast Hotel Lethbridge. This special night is in support of the emergency youth shelter, The Core. This year's gala includes a delicious dinner, silent and live auctions, and live entertainment by the Chevelles. For tickets and sponsorship opportunities, contact Colleen Campbell 
by calling 403-317-1777 or visit woodshomes.ca. And that's your Bridge City News Community Calendar. Many Canadians struggle with various forms of mental health issues. Often there's a stigma attached to it, but there is hope for people. Today's guest went through some serious tough times before becoming free from anxiety issues. Sarah Ball is a blogger, public speaker, and author of Fearless in 21 Days, A Survivor's Guide to Overcoming Anxiety. Welcome to Bridge City News, Sarah. Yeah, thanks for having me. So here it is, your book. You wrote this book out of your own personal mm -hmm. experiences with anxiety. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you overcame all of those challenges. Well, I started having anxiety probably in my mid-30s. Um, it started off actually as burnout. I just had my fifth child, wow. um, exhausted, of course. Yeah. Um, went through a series of traumatic events back to back that really kind of elevated my stress. And it started off with a panic attack. And I'd had one before, a couple years before, and dealt with it. It was fine, but it didn't go away. And I continued to have panic attacks every day, every day, every day. And eventually that escalated into a full-blown general anxiety disorder. So it's kind of what you would call a nervous breakdown, <laughs> which I hate using that term, but that's what it was. And I became physically, mentally, and spiritually completely depleted. And yeah, my mental health just took a nosedive. Did your husband and maybe your kids say, did we help contribute to this? We're so sorry mom or honey like what happened no there? I don't think no? so I okay. think that it was such you know it seemed like it happened overnight but if I look back at it it was really a slow derail starting with fatigue starting with you know feeling burnt out and a little bit of depression mixed in there and just not taking care of my mental health so um, I don't feel like they blame themselves at all no. how many people do you feel really struggle with anxiety and depression is it more common than we realize yes absolutely more common than we realize. Um, I minister to a lot of people who struggle with anxiety, OCD and depression and I have had um, emails and people reaching out to me who are you know 50 year old business executives in Toronto to nurses to counselors and therapists to 18 year olds to 90 year olds 90 years old like this is something that is it affects everyone yeah and it's no respecter of persons <laughs> so anxiety wow. i think is very chronic right now what do you think are the underlying roots of anxiety is a lot of stress and pressures we put on ourselves today yeah or maybe our boss has put on us yeah i think it's a combination of a few things um i think that it's all um physical can be physical mental and spiritual is kind of a combination and everybody has a different um, sort of makeup of how they are, right? So someone could have had anxiety from the time they were born. It can be something to do with their makeup and other people, it can be from traumatic experiences. And then yes, high stress, high stress, high pressure culture, hustle hard, right? Achieve everything, perfection, and do it at the cost of your mental health. So Sarah, you mentioned earlier about fatigue, but what are some of the other red flags or warning signs that we really have to watch out for that we may be suffering from anxiety or depression? Mm -hmm. Well, anxiety and depression surprisingly manifests physically. And usually that's the first sign. So there is the mental part of it for sure, the worried thoughts, the obsessive thoughts, the, the sad thoughts, all that kind of stuff. But usually when you know that it's gotten to an unhealthy place, it really shows up in your body. So heart palpitations, fatigue, um, headaches, body aches, uh, chest pains, you name it. I'm pretty sure that anxiety, people who struggle with anxiety and depression feel it all over their body. So do you think maybe a holiday to Hawaii, somewhere tropical, will really <laughs> alleviate the symptoms right away? Well, sometimes it's true. You have to be able to create a balance in your life and rest and play is a huge part of that. Absolutely. How do, how do you know when it's time to go to your doctor though? Your physician? Well, I think when it starts to um, affect your everyday life, when it's starting to affect your relationships, when it's starting to affect the fact that you're not going out anymore, that you've really made your life small. So a lot of people who struggle with anxiety and depression, their life gets very small, very isolated. That's a big one. And then physical symptoms as well. Um, of course, suicidal thoughts, anything that's very severe and just not feeling like yourself, I think you need to have a conversation with your doctor. Now, what about a panic attack? What does that actually look like? Uh, how can I tell if one is coming on? Well, a lot of people mix up anxiety attack and a panic attack, thinking right. anxiety attack is just excessive worry or, you know, I'm freaking out because I have to speak publicly or whatever. But a panic attack is actually a physiological thing that happens to your body. So they've actually been able to scientifically show you that it lasts 20 minutes. So it's actually a thing that happens to your body. So what happens is, is when you are faced with a potentially life 
um, you know, dangerous situation, right? Mm -hmm. Your body goes in to protect itself. So it's actually a gift God's given us. It's something that's created within us to be able to protect ourselves, to be able to think on our feet, to be able to run away as fast as we can, to have the adrenaline and the strength that we need to fight a situation. But when you're dealing with panic attack, all that stuff's happening to your body because of nothing, it just comes out of nowhere. And so oftentimes it begins with pain in the chest and but the um, heart palpitations, shortness of breath, I can't breathe and racing thoughts. But the worst part, which is very common with people with panic disorder is a sense of impending doom. Oh. I'm going to die. Wow. Like the, you, you have an absolute conviction that you're about to die. And so even though, you know, whatever the trigger was or wherever this panic attack's coming from, you logically know in your head that you're not going to die, but the intense emotion of that is very strong. Now, you also struggled with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Can you really explain to our viewers what exactly that is? Well, a and lot how you overcame it. Yes, a lot of people think obsessive compulsive disorder is just you need to have everything clean and perfect, but that well, can not. be farther from the truth. Okay. And I know we throw that word out there a lot of times, but there are many different forms of OCD. And basically what it is, is it starts with the obsession. So it's obsessive thoughts, which is an anxious thought, right? So if I touch this thing, I'm going to get sick. Or if, if this happens, then this bad thing's going to happen. So it's a, it's a thought that you begin to obsess about. And the compulsions are behaviors that, that you do to actually ease the thought. So where you get the excessive hand washing. So I'll touch something, I have a thought that I'm gonna die, I might get sick. And so if I go to wash my hands, it doesn't feel better. So I wash my hands twice, then I wash my hands three times, then I wash my hands five times. Wow. And then at the fifth time or however long it takes, I start to feel better, that creates a, a pattern. So then you're like, in order for me to ease the anxiety, I have to wash my hands five times. For me, what I struggled with was harm OCD, which isn't spoken about much. Um, it's one of the most common forms of OCD, which is actually um, sheer terror and anxiety about hurting yourself or someone you love. Now, in your study and your research, you know, dealing with a lot of these uh, different conditions, you know, whether it's OCD or, or anxiety and depression, was there ever any talk of maybe minerals and vitamins helping as well, or supplements to try and help you get back on track? Well, I, th I think that's part of it. I never really discovered any specific thing. And I think a lot of people who struggle with anxiety go down this route of trying to like heal it through the body, which is a huge part of healing. And anyone who's going through it, you have to talk to your doctor, you need to get your blood tested, all those stuff. Because there definitely is a lot of medical conditions that can really bring on anxiety and high adrenaline and stuff like that. So it's really important. But it's a balance. And so it's really important. Exercise is really important eating well is really important, and taking care of your mental and spiritual health as well. How about antidepressants? How um, much of a role would they play, do you think? I, I think that with antidepressants, um, I'm not a doctor, but with antidepressants, um, when it comes to depression, it can actually help heal depression. It can actually help boost your serotonin levels and get you kind of on a right path. With anxiety, it does not. It just sort of masks it for the time. But if you're drowning, <laughs> Sometimes you need to have something to keep you afloat to be able to do the deeper work and be able to um, deal with the roots. So I absolutely believe in medication, that there's a time and a place for it, and, um, but not to put all of your faith into that. that that's just a, a small part of your whole healing. A lot of people just go to medical route and not deal with the deeper issues, and then they're stuck on it for the rest of their lives. So. Some psychologists I've spoken with in the past in regards to people considering taking their own lives, suicide, mm -hmm. they say there are a lot of warning signs, they, they always talk about it, talk about doing it, mm -hmm. but then eventually, when you don't hear them talk about it anymore, yeah. that's when you need to be concerned. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, this is a real, real issue. There's, you know, from young children to teenagers to middle-aged women to grown men, I mean, suicidal thoughts can become very intense and very real. It's, I know it's something that I had experienced as well. Um, very terrifying for the person who has experienced it. But, you know, first of all, it's so important that we get help that you surround yourself in all ways, whether it's psychologist, therapist, doctor, and you just have a team of people working with group, you. Right? A support group, yeah. It's really, really important, and yeah. You know, it's interesting too, a lot of the psychologists I've interviewed in the past, they say the person who's considering taking their own life, you know, you say, well, that's being very selfish. You can leave your wife, your kids behind, mm -hmm. your friends, your parents. Mm -hmm. They don't think about that. No. It's very self-absorbed, self They're self thinking of the pain. The pain. They just want pain. it to go away. Not necessarily the consequence, but the pain and the emptiness that they feel. Absolutely. So how much of a difference does it really help to have maybe somebody go alongside with you in the journey? Maybe an accountability partner mm -hmm. or a good friend mm -hmm. that understands and knows exactly where you came from and where you're headed. Well, 
One of the first things my doctor said to me is the two things that work more efficiently than medication is exercise and community. That those two things have been shown and proven to actually help mental health more than anything else, even more than medication. So it's absolutely vital that you have a community and a support system. And not everybody has because there is a stigma attached to mental illness. Um, not always spouses really understand or friends really understand what you're going through. This is something I experienced. My husband was an amazing support to me. But I did have some people in my lives that didn't understand it and just said, well, stop thinking about it then. Yeah. We'll just you know, snap out of it, because they were used to me being strong. Snap out of it. They weren't used to me being like that. This was something very different for them to see me go through this. Well, let me ask you, Sarah, what things should we say and not say to somebody who may be going through that journey of depression and maybe even suicidal thoughts? Well, absolutely. Snap out of it. It's probably Do not, not there. say, no. just stop <laughs> thinking about it, because they right. can't. It's a mental illness. That's like trying to tell someone with diabetes, just stop you know, yeah. <laughs> stop being sick. I mean, you can't do that, right? Or stop eating lots of pies and cakes. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's, yeah, so I think the most important thing is to, I always say, is to ask them, what, how can, how, you know, what, what can I do? And if you're the one struggling to articulate what it is you need, this doesn't help me, this helps me when you say this, and to help them get out of their head, to have a safe place to share really uncomfortable and scary thoughts that might seem ridiculous to you and you might go oh my gosh that's ridiculous but to them it's so absolutely real and it's definitely more intense when they keep it to themselves and they're obsessing and mulling over these thoughts but the minute they have a safe place to articulate it without any judgment or it being dismissed quickly as oh that's just dumb they have a safe place to share and it just eases the anxiety of it. You know I'm glad you brought that up because uh, one of my close family members was battling alcoholism mm. and I, I had a really hard time not knowing what to say, how mm -hmm. I could support this individual, mm -hmm. right? So I went to Al-Anon, mm. you know, awesome. well, family members yeah. who are, are dealing with alcoholism, right, in the family, and they said the number one thing to do, so the defense walls, the walls don't go up, is to say to this person, do you love me? And this person says, of course I love yeah. you. I have a problem. Can you please help me with my problem? Yes, I have a problem with your drinking. Mm. Can you please help me? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's just interesting how they yeah. kind huh. of switched it, yeah. the roles, and, uh, and it actually worked, yeah. to be honest with you. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So the walls didn't go up saying, yeah. you've yeah. got a problem, you know, you're pointing yeah. the finger, yeah. but I have the problem. Yes. Can you please help me with my problem? Yeah, exactly. Right? Yes. At the end of the day, they still got a problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, but I mean, this is how we're going to help people, right, yeah. at the same time. Yeah, that's right. Because someone who's struggling with anxiety and depression, they don't want to. No. If they could just stop, they absolutely would choose to not. And right? don't they have to almost hit rock bottom and say, you know what, I realize that I have an issue in my life that needs to be addressed? It's yes. the same thing with smokers a yeah. lot of times. I don't yeah. have a problem with smoking. Yeah. I'm fine. You should quit. I yeah. don't want to quit, right? Yeah. Yeah. But somebody has, has to start from within, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Which is really hard when you're struggling with anxiety and depression because there's not a lot of strength there right. to pull yourself up. And that's right. the hardest part. And that's why people get really stuck in it for years and years at a time because you really don't have a lot of inner strength and mental strength to be able to do it. And so I really believe that there are tools and there are ways to actually rewire and renew your mind and um, disciplines that we can take that are really difficult in the beginning but actually make a huge difference. Yeah. So Sarah, how were you finally set free? Well, um, definitely not an overnight experience for me. Um, I felt like I needed to take the hard way out in order for me to be able to help others. So that's something I really believe. Um, for me, it was really paying attention to all three aspects of myself, my body, my mind, and my spirit. I really needed to cut down on a lot of the reasons why I was taking on so much and doing so much and simplifying my life. Um, rest became a huge weapon for me, learning to rest, even if it was at the judgment of other people, that, you know, whatever, that was really important for me. Exercise was really important. And learning to take my thoughts captive, learning to understand, you know, why I was thinking the way that I did, um, learning to, um, sort of have conversations with myself to help myself get out of it. So I did a lot of work, but um, for me, the very sort of defining moment of, of my whole healing that is continues to be my maintenance in every area of my life is just being able to fall back on this foundation of the love of God. That's been huge for me because oftentimes you'll find that people who struggle with anxiety, this theology is a little bit messy. Sarah Ball, blogger, public speaker, and author of Fearless in 21 Days, A Survivor's Guide to Overcoming Anxiety. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, here on Bridge thanks City for News. having me. Appreciate it. There are millions upon millions of children living in poverty around the world. It seems like a black hole that can never be filled. But progress is being made, and reality is we can all pitch in to make a big difference. Barry Sloan White is president of Compassion Canada, joins me now via Skype from London, Ontario. Welcome back to BCN, Barry. 
Thank you. It's so good to be with you today. Now, Compassion Canada recently reached a major milestone. Two million children now registered for Compassion Canada programs around the world. Congratulations, two million kids. That's quite the accomplishment. That is. That, that includes our entire global Compassion family. And uh, it, uh, it's interesting because when you look at the stats, it took us 56 years to reach a million and only 10 years to double that to two million. So, <laughs> wow, wow. It's, it kind of blows your mind when you think of it. So can you really explain to our viewers what this really means for Compassion Canada and for these children? Well, yeah, it means that there are 2 million children in 25 countries who each one of them individually are connected with a caring, loving Christian sponsor who is not just uh, giving them the financial resources that they need to survive, but also more, even more importantly, they're investing in them spiritually through praying for them, through mentoring them, through letters. And we have thousands of sponsors every year who actually go and physically visit their children. That's a real bonus. And you work through the local churches. Explain that dynamic. Yeah, we're very unique that way. Uh, God, God really instilled in the hearts of our leaders over these 66 years that uh, his strategy for bringing the gospel to the world is the local church. That's not new. We all know that. Uh, but really, God called us to align with his strategy. And so we work in 7,000 communities around the world, the 25 countries. Wow. Every single compassion program project is housed, located in a local Christian church. So, Barry, what kind of support specifically? Does Compassion Canada deliver for the kids? Well, through the local church, we create a child development center. So it's an after-school program that the children come to. Uh, and there, each child is assigned to an adult tutor. That's a Christian volunteer from the church who serves as a mentor, helps them with their homework, uh, prays with them, cares for them, ensures that they themselves are well, does a home visit every week to the child's home and uh, ensures that that child is really getting the full benefits of the compassion curriculum and the compassion program. These are things like health care, education, of course, uh, social skills, um, things like vocational skills. But most importantly for us, that every child is learning about Jesus Christ, because we so strongly believe that the answer to poverty is Jesus. He changes people from the inside out. And so that's why we work with the local church because it's the best place and probably the only place that we could really be effective in this strategy. Yeah, it'd be a light in your local community, a light in a dark place. Barry, can you Absolutely. share any personal stories of an individual child or a family that has really been helped by Compassion Canada? Oh, so many, so many. But let me, let me tell you one that I've come to love and respect uh, over the years. It's a young lady, now an adult. Her name is Harriet, and she's from a little village in Uganda. Now, Harriet's family were so poor, desperately poor, that in that poor village, they were the poor ones. Everyone else looked down on them because they were the worst off. Her father, as often happens, abandoned the family, left her mom, her, and two young siblings with nothing. I mean, their house was just borrowed tin and, and, and scrounged stuff from the, 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 the local refuge dump. She had no options. Like she, she really didn't know what to do and desperately wanted to help her mom and her family. So around the age seven and eight, she imagined that the only option she had is what she heard a few other girls in her village had done. When they got older, around 12, they went to Kampala to the capital city and they got a job working on the streets. Now we know what that job is. It's, it's not a job that we would want any of our children to get involved in. But Harriet knew that she was too young. At age seven, eight, she was too young. So she imagined around 12 years of age, she would make the journey. And that way she would get a little bit of income to help her family. Just as she turned eight, the local church in her village partnered with Compassion 
and we created a compassion child development center, like I just told you. She, because she and her fa her siblings were the poorest, they were the first ones to be registered and sponsored. So fast forward to years later, she did end up going to Campola after she graduated. She went to Campola not to work on the streets, but to go to university, to go to law school. And today, Harriet is a lawyer specializing in children's human rights. Wow. She, she not only got an education through compassion, but she found Jesus Christ, her mom, her brother and sister, all of them are serving the Lord. And now today as a, as a, a lawyer, she is also very actively involved in her local church in Kampala and just ministering to many, many people, children like her. What an incredible success story. There are thousands of Harriets uh, wow. in our program. And you must have met quite a few of them. I mean, 25 years as president yeah. with Compassion Canada. You're stepping down this October. Tell me about that whole experience being involved in this worthwhile organization. Well, you know, I've been here actually 35 years, 25 as president. So I've got a long history, 35 years of seeing God at work firsthand around the world in some of the worst and poorest and desperate situations. But I can tell you how that working through the local church and seeing the local Christians, the nationals, minister to their own people, equipping them to care for their own people, to do what they want to do and they know to do, but lacking resources. We have seen such incredible, incredible impact. In fact, if for those that are sponsoring, you'll get our Compassion Magazine in the mail. It just came out. I just got it on my desk today. The front cover is a photograph of one of our sponsored children, a little boy from Dominican Republic named Tony, but he's not a sponsored child right now. He just was appointed our national country director for Compassion Dominican Republic, looking after over 100,000 children. And that is just absolutely exciting. So I get to see that firsthand. I get a front row seat in that over these years. Now let's discuss the need that still exists and the steps needed to help these kids. And which country specifically is the need the greatest? Well, yeah, we work in 25 countries. It's, it's hard to say which country the need is greatest because in those countries, even those that are a little bit better off economically, we zero in on the, the poverty pockets. So we, we target children and families who live on less than $1.90 a day. That's our target audience. Uh, and there are, there are 300 plus million children in that category and we sponsor two million of them so you can see the need is still huge and so our goal is to not stop to not sleep until we've gotten one more and one more and one more and one more how about some of the pushback that you receive from some of the governments in some of these 25 countries let's talk a bit about Ooh, that. And yeah, the obstacles that's, you face yeah, right yeah that is real because we are so uh, in your face, Christian, if I can be that bold, uh, our, our whole program is overtly Christ centered. So that gets the attention of governments in some countries, not all. There's about five countries of the 25 where we work, who, where the governments are watching us like a hawk. And every year they tighten the vice just a little tighter to make it just a little more difficult for us. We have a couple things going for us though. So first of all, we are completely nationalized. We don't send missionaries or expatriates. Uh, that would also be flagged. So everyone involved in the Compassion program at the ground level are nationals from their countries, from their communities. So that really helps balance uh, some of the issues that the governments uh, look at. But here's, here's, here's the the misinformation, the misunderstanding. When some foreign governments see us working with the poor through the local church, they assume that we're only helping them so that we can coerce them or worse, force them to become Christians. So that's the accusation that is leveled against us very, very regularly. Uh, and they, they totally ignore the fact 
that children that come into our program, most of them are from non-Christian families and backgrounds. None of them ever have to become a Christian. <laughs> the problem is for the governments, most of them do become Christians because once you encounter the real genuine love of Christ in a tangible way, it's pretty hard to resist. Now, I understand that out of the two million registered kids, about 160,000 of them are still waiting for a sponsor. Barry, can you explain yeah. the difference between children with sponsors and those without? Yeah, that, that's a typical day for us. So the way we work is we register children. When we find children that, are, that qualify in, uh, in the need area, we register them into our program. We take all the information. We do the home assessment and all of that. Once they are registered in, our, in a, one of our projects, they immediately get all the help that the sponsored children get. Then we go about our business, like here in Canada, we go about the work of trying to find a sponsor to take that registered child. Once we find a sponsor who's willing to take that child's photograph and to say yes, then that child goes from being registered to being sponsored. This, they, they get all the benefits, all the help. The difference is they now have a name, a person, a face of someone to build a relationship. And for these children in this state of poverty, that is actually as valuable to them as the actual physical benefits that they get. Can people even choose which child from a specific country that they would like to sponsor? Absolutely. You can go on our website, compassion.ca. You can select the a child, you can look through all the photos, you can select an age, a gender. A lot of families do this because they like to sponsor a child the same age as their children and help their children to, to grow up with them. But yeah, you, you have that liberty to make those selections. You know, people often say to us, like, I go to a, a specific country on business every year, or I go on a mission trip. I would like to sponsor a child in that country so the next trip I can go and visit them. We go, absolutely, we can make that happen. Many years ago, uh, my family sponsored a child in San Salvador, El Salvador, and I tell you, it was awesome. very rewarding. We did that for many years, and just him sending back pictures of himself and his family, yeah. how he's getting school supplies and food and clothing. It was just so rewarding, I have to tell you that. But you know, sometimes, Barry, people have concerns about which particular charities they can trust, and will the money actually go towards helping out these kids. So how would you maybe put those fears at ease? Well, uh, there, there are many things I could say. I could point to all the reports uh, that put compassion as number one. But I would say last year, we had just over 9,000 sponsors travel around the world to visit their children. Wow. 9,000 mini audits. That's the way I look at them. Every sponsor that came back either sponsored another child or got their friend to sponsor a child because they were so impressed with the impact. We never get the question, what do you do with my money? The question that we get consistently is, how do you do all of that with that little bit of money that I give you? That's the best, best answer I can, I can give you right now. Now, one of the amazing things that stands out with compassion as well is that like you mentioned earlier, you don't apologize for making the gospel message front and center about what you do, that in your face Christianity, so to speak. Tell me why that's so important. It's important because the root of poverty is not a lack of food. That's a symptom. The root cause of poverty is the sin that entered the world through Adam and Eve's disobedience to God. That created the poverty that we in this generation, thousands of years later, still encounter. And the only way, the only um, cure for that kind of poverty, that spiritual poverty, is the gospel. We can put as many band-aids on the symptoms as we want. And there's nothing wrong with that. The food aid programs, healthcare programs, educational programs, they're all good, they're necessary, they're wonderful, but at the end of the day or at the end of a lifetime, none of those Band-Aids will bring that child or adult into an eternity with Christ, only the gospel. So what we believe at Compassion, it's not and or. It's not the Band-Aid 
or the gospel. It's the band-aid and the gospel. So the gospel permeates everything we do at Compassion at every level. So Barry, our viewers are watching right now at Bridge City News. They want to sponsor a child. Quickly explain how they can do that. Simply go to compassion.ca slash sponsorship and you'll see there uh, a menu of children. And as I said earlier, you can select age, gender, country, uh, any, any selection criteria that you might have. Uh, fill out the form, send that in to us, uh, and we'll get you going on that right away. It's as simple as a couple of clicks. And helping out a great cause. Barry Sloan White, President of Compassion Canada, thanks a lot for joining me today from London, Ontario. It's my pleasure, Hal. Thank you. And behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless. Have a great day.